Right, folks, let's get going. Um, in the first 10 minutes, the second years are going to be slightly bored because they've seen matrices before. On the other hand, they will tell you why exactly it is. It's a time to show sure you with that stuff. Um, there are two principal reasons why we need matrices. One is computing. It turned out, after digital computers have been designed, that that is one of the most numerically efficient ways of calculating things. And the second reason is physics, uh, broadly understood, from engineering to quantum mechanics, where a lot of analytical equations involving derivatives, large systems of equations, can be recast in a remarkably compact form using matrices. So it is convenience and numerical efficiency, and on occasion it gives you better physical insight. And then, um, in around about 1930s, it turned out that there are quantities in physics um, that can take, for example, exactly two or exactly three different values. And at that point, matrices became unavoidable physics because that's the only way to describe such systems. Anyway, formally speaking, a matrix is just an ordered array of numbers. Okay. We will typically number them by row and column. So if you have A, first row, first column, 1, 1. First row, second column, 1, 2. All the way to the first row, nth column, 1, A. Then second row, first column. Second row, second column, second row, nth column, and all the way to A, nth row, first column, A, nth row, second column, A, nth row, nth column. And the matrix need not be square, so the number M can be different from the number N, and this is just called uh, an M. And matrix. And the elements can come from any number fields. They can be real, they can be complex, they can be rational, they can be symbolic. You will see instances of all of that. And to us today, it's not so much the definition as what you can do with the matrix. And their principal job is to abbreviate large systems of equations. I have already shown to you uh, in the previous lecture, how large linear systems can be written in this appropriate form. And the principal job of a matrix is to transform vectors uh, within a given space, between spaces of different dimensions. So let's say we have a vector y, which is some other vector that has been rotated, translated, scaled, something had been done to it, but uh, the operation had been linear. X, or equivalently in Dirac's notation, Y is A X. And that is the following. We have that matrix over there, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, N. We write a vector next to it, so x1 all the way to xm, in this case m. And the way we multiply a matrix by a vector is as follows. You take a matrix and you take its row, you take the vector, you take this vector, lift it, multiply it element by element into this row, and you sum up the result. And then that is the first element of your answer. Then you take that column, multiply it into the second row, element by element, sum up, that's your second element. As you can see, a computer would be efficient at this because we are dealing with what's called sequential memory access and array multiplications. So this matrix uh, is usually stored in memory, either column-wise or row-wise, depending on what you want to do with that. Uh, the vector is just stored linearly, 
And so if the computer can access its own memory linearly, which is always very, very fast, and we are talking 50 gigabytes per second or so, and then do sequential multiplications, which is what CPUs are really good at, and this operation is really fast on a computer. Now, notice that we are indexing these things by numbers, and so we can say that, okay, our A will have elements. Elements and K, for example, 3, 2, and our X will likewise have elements. And one of the ways of writing these things that is particularly convenient is in the index notation. We can say that Y nth element is a sum over K, A, and K, X, K. And that is actually exactly the same as this. Y1 all the way to M. Let's think about it. We are taking our x, so x1, x2, and so on. So this is this index here. We are taking it and multiplying this row, so we are summing across the second index of this matrix, 1, 2, and so on, m. So notice sum over k, that is the sum over the second index in here, and it comes from the nth row, first, second, third, and so on. So we are taking this, multiplying this, the summation happens over the second index of the matrix, and the first index of the matrix is the number of the row, and that's the number of the element that we are going to get here. So summation over the second index, in the formal language in physics, this is called index contraction when you multiply and sum up. And the result is the only index that survives in here, and that's the nth, and so this is the formal way of doing that. Now, this is the most general way of, as mathematicians say, mapping different spaces, or having a space transformed, because this operation is linear. Now, imagine we have y, 1 equals a of a x1, and then y2 equals a x2. Then if we have a linear combination of the two vectors, which so a times alpha x1 plus beta x2, because multiplication is linear, there's nothing in here that's nonlinear with respect to either a or x. We can take scalars out of the bracket and we get alpha a x1 plus beta a x2, which is alpha y1 plus beta y2. And this is the property that I had already introduced uh, in 1047. Those of you who haven't seen it there, we have seen it in Andrea's lectures. This is called linearity. So it's a linear transformation. And it applies to a great variety of operations, for example, rotations. If we have two vectors that are being rotated, it stands to reason we can prove it for them, but we don't have the time that their sums and differences would also be rotated. If we are scaling things, if we are shifting things, sums and differences of vectors and their various multiples will also be transformed in exactly the same way. So this is what matrices exist to facilitate, and this linear transformation um, as a process is surprisingly powerful and occurs uh, everywhere in physics. Right, so the next thing we need to learn is to multiply matrices. So one matrix by another one. This is done in the following way. You have um, a row here, and then there's another matrix that has a column. And what we do, 
is we take this column, we multiply it by this row. So if this is n row, and that is k column here, we take this row, this column multiplied by this row, sum it up, and we put the result into the corresponding row and column of the answer. And then we repeat until the answer is completely filled up. Take the first row, second row, third row, and then we fill up this column. Take the first column, second column, and so on, and we fill up the rest of the elements. Now, this is necessary because in many cases, transformations are composite. If we, for example, take a vector x, and we would like to rotate it first, there will be some matrix that rotates it. We will get to that by the end of the lecture, what this matrix is. But to us, it's just a matrix. But then we perhaps also want an inversion. Uh, and there will be another matrix that accomplishes inversion. Now, the second and third years have come across group theory, so they've actually encountered these operations before. Uh, and um, it's sometimes convenient to actually have a composite transformation. We want our rotation to always be accompanied by inversion. And uh, multiplication of arrays is associative. We can multiply them in any order. Remember the associativity property of a space. And you had actually demonstrated in the previous workshop that matrices are a space. And so associativity applies. And we can do it this way. We can say, OK, we needn't multiply x first by r and then by i. We can multiply i by r and have a composite, what's called improper rotation. Rotation, that is composite with inversion. And we can call it s. So just as well, y will be s. So, in order to compose vector space transformations, we ought to be able to multiply matrices, and this is how we've done. Now, this is all fairly abstract without concrete examples, so let us multiply a bunch of vectors and matrices together. We have a practical feeling for how that's done. Again, uh, the only way to really remember that is by practice. At some point, your hand will just do that for you. You'll be sitting and thinking about weather, and you will be multiplying matrices in the process. Uh, and um, yeah, it's just practice, practice, practice. So, let's take some simple matrix. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And multiply it by the top. A, B, C. And this is a very typical thing that you would do. For example, this is something a computer would do when you are playing a computer game. It needs to rotate some monsters on your screen at 60 frames per second. And then we are talking a couple of million vertices, perhaps, in those monsters, in their meshes. And so the computer needs to perform a couple of million rotations 60 times per second. So we are talking in about 100 million rotations per second, which means 100 million of these durations per second. You can see why graphics cards are necessary, because even modern CPUs aren't terribly um, good at doing these things on quite such a grand scale. OK, so as per the recipe, take that, multiply it there, sum up. We have a delta, a plus 2, b plus 3c. Take that, multiply it by this row, 4a plus c. Take that, multiply it by this, sum up, 7a plus a b plus 9c. That's it. Nice and easy. And once the summation is taken, for example, when a, b, and c acquire some specific values, then we will get it. The same goes for complex matrices. These numbers need to be real. So I have an example. I will not 
write it out on the board because this is going to be a great big messy exercise in multiplying complex numbers, but I have an example of a complex matrix there. Now, for matrix, matrix multiplication, we really need to go through an example in some detail. Uh, but before I do that, let us write another indexed formula like this. If we have two matrices, A and B, let's take a look at how their indices combine. We want the n kth element of the answer. So this will be C and K. Well, clearly there will be a sum and a product. We need to find out what is the sum over and what is the product over. Our matrix A, its nth row is this one. It's dictated by the resulting index, so we have nth row here. But we are summing over the following index. So let's call it i. And there's a sum over i. Now, v has a fixed column, so that's the second index, k. But we are summing over the rows, but with the same index, i, k. And this is it. So this is how you multiply matrices in index notation. Note that what is contracted is what's called the middle index. You have A and I, B, I, K, and it's the inside index in this product that is being collapsed. And then you've got the outside indices combining here. This is a surprisingly deep statement because when you deal, and if ever any of you do, with general relativity, uh, these contractions uh, we involving the metric tensor of space-time will always have this form. So this is the equation uh, which actually Einstein abbreviated uh, quite a lot. He was so tired of writing these sums that he developed a special notation that actually allows you to avoid these sums. Uh, but uh, I will not discuss that any further. I will simply note that contractions of this type by ubiquitous in general relativity. Okay, let us go through an example of how we multiply a matrix by a matrix. Again, one, two, three, four, five matrix on the left. Nine. And let's have something with a complicated structure on the right. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And the result will be 3 by 3. And let's think about it. Okay, so we're looking at the corner element here. This is first row, first column. So we take the first column of what occurs on the right, multiply it by the first row, so 1 times 1, 2 times 0, and 3 times 1. Sum it up, we get 4. Then, if we want the next element, what shifts is the column. So take the second column here, multiply the first row 2. Take the third column, multiply here 4. Now, moving to the second row of the result, so we need to use the second row here. Second row, first column 4 plus 6, 10. Second row, second column, five. Second row, third column, four, six, ten. And then third row, first column, seven plus nine, sixteen. Third row, second column, eight. And third row, third column, seven, nine, sixteen. That is how you multiply matrices, and you will get plenty of practice with it. Now, we need to introduce a few more auxiliary operations that one can do with matrices. Remember vector transpose when you write a vector not as a row, but as a column, uh, and the other way around. Uh, this is to do with this geometric schematics, right? 
uh, because during multiplication, rows are on the left and columns are on the right. If you were to multiply vectors as rows, you would have to have them on the other side. So, for example, and this. So, whereas multiplication of a matrix by a column happens on this side due to those geometric rules, multiplication by a row happens on that side because then the topology matches up. And then the result of such a multiplication would be another row vector. If you were to multiply a column vector, column vector goes here, and the result is the column. But we need to be able to transpose vectors. And at some point, because matrices can have different numbers of rows and columns, we will need to transpose matrices. Transpose related operations. In linear algebra, one is called conjugate transpose, and the other is just transpose. So we have a conjugate transpose, a dagger, so there's a little symbol there, and if we have a um, dagger and k, we swap the indices, so we swap rows and columns, and, and we complex conjugate every element. Geometrically, this looks like this. If you have a11 one, one, all the way to a11, one, a11, a11, m, the elements that occur on the diagonal stay put and simply get conjugated. But the elements that occur off the diagonal are swapped around. So this is a 1 1 complex conjugate. But then in this corner, instead, we have that a m 1, a m, a m conjugate. So the conjugate transpose operation, swap of diagonal elements, and complex conjugate every element. In the case when matrix is real, we don't need to do complex conjugates. So in the real case, A is called transpose, little t in the index, and K is KN. So the row index becomes the column index, column index becomes the row index. That is transpose. And uh, well, we can do a basic example of that. If we have one, two, three, four, transpose. One and four remain where they have been, and two and three we are swapping. If we have a complex matrix, one plus i, one minus i, three, I dagger, so conjugate transpose operation. Diagonal stays put, simply gets conjugated to 1 minus i minus i, and the off diagonal gets swapped and then conjugated. So 1 minus i and then 3. That's the conjugate transpose operation. You will see a lot of this in geometric rotations, you will see a great amount of this in quantum mechanics. In fact, one of the signatures of the quantum mechanical observable operator is that it remains unchanged when this transformation is applied, the so-called Hermitian property. Okay, so these are two things you can do to matrices. Um, an important um, operation that comes in the context of quantum mechanics, you may have been told already that for a particle, it is impossible to simultaneously measure precisely the coordinate and the momentum in the direction of that coordinate. Or, and in other conditions, it's impossible to simultaneously have precise measurement of all three angular momentum components. Or you cannot simultaneously precisely measure energy and time. 
is a cold uncertainty relations and actually mathematically, I think sooner or later, maybe in the third year, you will be proven that there are consequences of the relation I'm about to introduce. It's called the commutator. Now, for matrices, multiplication is associative, so you can swap brackets, move brackets around, but it is not commutative. So, in general, for matrices, A B does not equal B A. This can be illustrated quite easily on rotations in three dimensions. If you take a pair of rotations, then it's intuitively clear that the outcome will depend on which order you apply the rotations. So, apply the first rotation first and second rotation second, it's not the same as applying them in reverse order, your vector might end up in a different place. And this is called non-commutation, and the difference between AB and BA BA is denoted as A comma B in square brackets, and this is called the commutator of two matrices A and B. That's just the definition. One place you will encounter this a lot is in angular momentum theory and then in magnetic resonance. So an mass spectroscopy in particular is just built for commutators. Everything there is a commutator. So it is an important property. But in practice, when you are given two matrices, well, multiply them this way and multiply them that way and subtract the answer. And that is it. In particular, in quantum mechanics, if you do the calculation of a coordinate operator, momentum operator, I think that's pi h bar. Uh, if memory serves, maybe minus h bar, I don't remember. Uh, but that's the reason why you can simultaneously measure the two of them. And it has to be in the same direction. You can actually simultaneously measure x and the momentum, for example, along y because the corresponding matrix is commuted. Okay, now the next thing we can do with matrices is to introduce matrix functions. Now, that's a strange thing, right? What is a cosine of a matrix? It is not element by element. So matrix functions are not calculated element by element. They are calcul calculated in an interesting way. Let's think about what we can do with matrices by now. Well, we can add them up. We can multiply them by coefficients. And we can also multiply matrices together. So we have addition and multiplication. Which is already pretty good because any function can actually be written as a combination of additions and multiplications. That's called the Taylor series. We have seen it a few times before. So we know that for any sufficiently well behaved function, f of x is sum over f, f and derivative of 0 over n factorial x to the power n. Now, this is wonderful because whilst the original function may have had all sorts of horrible things in it that we wouldn't know how to calculate with matrices, this only has products and sums. And so this is actually easy. And so the function of a matrix f of a is therefore defined in terms of the Taylor series. And f and the derivative of the zero matrix both zero um, and oh wait, just actually scale a zero because it's a number uh, and factorial and then a to the power n. One good example of this is the matrix exponential. So the exponential of a is defined as a sum over n a to the n over n factorial. Now, this is massively useful. This is one of the most useful relationships in physics. And uh, let me start explaining why uh, when I consider chemical kinetics. So we'll jump a little bit ahead to provide the illustration for why this is so 
very useful. Imagine we have some kinetic system with three different substances. Three sets of concentrations and perhaps a couple of reversible chemical reactions between them. Now you all have your basic chemical kinetics by now, so you know how to write the rate laws for chemical reactions. So let us have a chemical reaction. Substance A going reversibly into substance B, going reversibly into substance C. And this will be K1 plus, K1 minus, K2 plus, K2 minus. So what is dA by dt? dt, well, it's being depleted in the forward reaction from proportional to concentration, K1 plus A. It's being replenished in the backward reaction plus K1 minus B. Then D, B by DT is being replenished in the forward reaction K1 plus A, uh, being depleted that way and that way minus K2 minus uh, K1 minus. K plus B and being depleted, uh, being, being replenished in the second backwards reaction. So plus K minus C. And then DC by DT, it's being replenished from B, K plus B, and being depleted in the backwards reaction, K2 minus C. Now, those of you who did camp uh, 1047 will remember the difficulties that we had solving such differential equations, and those of you who did straight this camp will remember first, second, and third order chemical kinetics. Now, I assure you that actually solving it equation by equation, by substitution, or whatever have you, the standard way, you can do it but it will take us a couple of lectures to properly do it. Let us, however, go and rewrite this in a matrix form. Well, we have d by dt, and we'll draw the three concentrations as a vector. A, B, C. Equals. Well, the k's are a matrix. We have here A, B, and C, and let us think what we need to put into this matrix in order for the equations to match up. Well, okay, that is a, a column, so we multiply it by a row and sum it up. So we need minus K1 plus to match up with A, then K1 minus to match the location of B, and then there is no C in here, so we have a zero. Well, that's the first row of our matrix. Second one has K1 plus for A. It has minus K1 minus and K2 plus. For B. And it has K2 minus for C. That's the second row. Then the third row doesn't have any A, so we have a zero here. Has K2 plus for B and has minus K2 minus for C. This matrix is called a kinetic matrix, and it's denoted K. The concentration vector we can simply call, I don't know, C is a vector. And so what this works out to is D by DT times the concentration vector is K multiplied by the concentration vector. Notice that, oh, the first thing that immediately hits you here is the notation has been vastly simplified. Instead of having to write that, we write this. And in fact, the matrix K can now have a great variety of forms. We can turn some reactions on. Some reactions on, 
Um, the details inside K will change, but the general form of this does not. In fact, even if I had 10,000 substances, writing a 10,000 strong system of equations would take a very long time. And, you know, hundreds of reactions is fairly routine, for example, atmospheric chemistry. But the form of this equation here doesn't actually change. And remember the first order chemical kinetics, when we had d by dt actual concentration was minus k that concentration. We knew the solution for this, right? It's the exponential. So this is ct is e minus kt c of 0. That was the solution to this little first order chemical kinetics problem. Turns out, I will not prove that it's a long story, but it turns out that the solution to this actually looks exactly the same, except it has a matrix exponential in it. So concentration is a function of time, is the exponential of k matrix t applied to concentration and time zero. Where this is the matrix exponential that I've just introduced out there on the board. Now, Behold what we just did. In one line, more or less, we have just solved an entire class of linear chemical kinetics problems. It doesn't matter how many equations there are, it doesn't matter how many substances there are, it doesn't matter how complicated the network of the chemical reactions would be. The solution is still this. And so long as we can write that matrix down, we can then instruct the computer to calculate the exponential for us, and that's the general solution. So, in like a three-liner transformation, the matrix depth annotation has allowed us to solve an entire class of physical problems. And then another equation of the same type, you will have it introduced in due course if you haven't already, is the time-dependent Schrodinger's equation. So, in fact, not only does it solve a large class of chemical kinetics problems, it solves the entirety of time-dependent quantum mechanics in exactly the same way. So, this matrix depth annotation is an immense power. Now, I need to introduce a few more uh, things, and then uh, in the next lecture we will proceed to study um, the various things about matrices. So, the one of those remaining things is matrix inverse. That's quite simple. So the matrix A minus 1 is defined as a matrix that does address equals a unit matrix. So if you take a matrix multiplied by its inverse, either from the left or from the right, you get a matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So remember that unit matrix in mathematics is not a matrix of all ones. It's a matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros on the off diagonal. If such a matrix exists, it doesn't always do, then this is called an inverse. We will not go into the details of how inverse is calculated. Just pointlessly complicated. Uh, let's just say for practical purposes, inverses are calculated on a computer. Uh, there are ways of doing that, but life's too short to really do it by hand. Um, then I need to introduce various types of matrices we will encounter. Type number one is a symmetric. And that's the matrix that doesn't change when you transpose. What that simply means is that the element in this corner is equal to the element in that corner, and when you swap them around, the matrix doesn't change. Uh, type number two is the complex generalization of this. It's called permission. That's when A conjugate transpose is equal to A. These things correspond to observable operators in quantum mechanics. Three are orthogonal. This 
axis when A transpose is equal to A inverse. This is true for rotations. Or the complex equivalent of that is unitary. That is when the transition conjugate, so the conjugate transpose is equal to the inverse. But this is true for time evolution operators in quantum mechanics. Uh, and then five traces. A trace is the sum of all diagonal elements. So when trace A is zero, it's called trace because it doesn't change on rotations, for example. And then item six, degenerate. That means rows or columns are linearly dependent. equivalent to zero determinant. So this is not particularly systematic, it's just the six types of matrices that you will encounter in your daily life. Mm -hmm. Now the last topic that I need to introduce is more or less an example, and this is rotation matrices. Imagine that we are rotating a bunch of vectors in two dimensions. You all remember how it's done, it's sines and cosines, and the way to write the down is x prime, the rotated version of x is x cosine phi minus y sine phi, and y prime was um, x sine phi plus y cosine phi. I think you must have done it in school or Look at the geometric rotation, you look at the sines and cosines, and this is how we get it. But this is actually quite easy to write in terms of matrices. So we have x prime y prime as a vector equals some matrix x y, and let's just fill it up. So x gets multiplied by a cosine, and then y gets multiplied by a minus sine phi phi. Then in the second line, x is multiplied by a sine, and y is multiplied by a cosine, and this is called R phi, the rotation matrix around the z axis in this case. Now, how do we do rotation matrices around other axis in three dimensions? Well, we can just do the following. So let's say x prime, y prime, z prime equals x, y, z. Let's say we would like to rotate the matrix around, rotate the vector around the x axis. Well, then clearly whatever's on x must remain unchanged. So let us multiply x by 1 and not mix any y or z. Because we are rotating around x, that means that y and z will be mixed, and so we have cosine phi minus sine phi, sine phi, cosine phi. And that is the Rx rotation phi. That's the rotation by the angle phi around the x axis. And then you can see how your computer would do it, right? The real rotation would be some composition of rotations around x, y, and z. And your computer will internally form the corresponding matrices, multiply them together to obtain the composite matrix for that particular rotation. And then whatever vector presents itself in whatever vertex or face or object in three dimensions, it will be just multiplied by that matrix and the rotation will be accomplished. Okay, that's all I have to say. So the summary is, these guys have seen this already, they will tell you why you need this. You really, really do. Uh, this is how you multiply, manipulate, and use matrices. A lot of practice will be required before you are comfortable with that, but much like differentiation and integration, this topic will stay with you all the way to retirement a practical chemist, almost no matter what you do, it is singularly important 
to make sure that you stay on top of that. Okay, and the next lecture will be the properties of specific matrices. Any questions?